Good afternoon, and welcome back to the Hidebound Convivium. It is March 13th, 2020, although the video may come out uh, later than that. And uh, today's topic will be on beauty and how the right is losing on beauty and can win on beauty. So uh, a couple of things before I, I get into my topic for the day. Uh, first of all, I may be more active than I typically am. Uh, I know I've been I've been pretty lax on uploading videos and such things because, of course, um, I have been really slammed with coursework. Uh, however, uh, because of the spread of COVID-19, my university, uh, and this may be a common experience uh, for those around the world who are dealing with this, my university has decided to uh, shut down for the next three weeks and move its classes online, which means for the next three weeks I will have a little bit more free time uh, to make these sorts of videos. So you may see a little bit more of me. Um, and then secondly, of course, I have good internet connection here uh, at my grandparents house so that'll be fun uh, and so, so what really got the ball rolling for this video what uh, prompted me to make this was the distributors recent video uh, which I believe was called uh, the right wing in nine points or understanding the right wing in nine points but essentially he broke down these nine points points that were uh, essentially first principles or fundamental principles um, that really characterized the right wing and he attempted to make a generic um, sort of categorization that fits all the kinds of people we would assume to be in the right wing. And that being the case, I, I liked the video. I only have a few small nitpicky things with it, but overall I thought it was a good video, I enjoyed it, and I think it's good that we're doing that kind of high theory uh, again here on the right wing. This is something I discussed in the um, in the Canis Society test stream uh, that uh, went on. Uh, I believe it's been it's it's been quite a while. It's been last last month at least. Um, I've been uh, uh, in derelict of duty uh, on that as well. So hopefully there will be a new or another Canis live stream soon. I still have to coordinate with my uh, co-host and, and we'll see about getting that up soon. But uh, that's beside the point. So the Distributus video went up and one of the things I really focused on, because uh, I got into a discussion about this later on, was the whole idea that he had of right-wingers and their fundamental moral axioms and their fundamental observational laws. And he also talks about uh, core political principles, but that's um, that's something I'm going to get into less in this video. What I really wanted to talk about is the relationship between these fundamental moral axioms and the fundamental observational laws that he talked about and the implications that this has for a right-wing uh, theory of aesthetics. Um, so that being said, what I'm going to preface this uh, talk with is the idea that really I, I believe the right wing has a really compelling, uh, not argument, but a really compelling evangelical sort of um, tool in aesthetics, in uh, the study of beauty and the production of uh, art and literature. Um, but to understand why I think that, I think it's helpful to walk us back through a couple of steps in intellectual history um, so that we understand the relationship between right-wing thought and beauty. So first I want to talk about the relationship between these fundamental moral axioms and fundamental observational laws. So uh, the way I see it is that these these two these two things are interrelated, right? So you, you can understand how fundamental observational laws or the, the way that you see the world, your perceptions of the world, you can understand how perceiving the world allows you to, when you apply reason to gain knowledge of the world, and then using that knowledge, you can postulate these fundamental moral axioms. And then of course it also works in reverse, uh, that our fundamental moral axioms sort of uh, color 
uh, our perceptions. They become a part of the way our reason acts upon our perceptions, and that reinforces our fundamental observational laws. The the second uh, way or the second configuration of those two is what some people will call confirmation bias, and it can it can manifest in confirmation bias, but I think it can also be referred to as a, as a kind of um, as a kind of uh, sort of enhanced uh, perceptive ability, right? So because, for example, modern people under, have knowledge of germ theory and they take it as axiomatic that um, you know surfaces are covered in microbial organisms, uh, that gives us a kind of heightened perception so that we can look at a surface and in some sense uh, understand or apply that knowledge uh, to that surface so that we know that there are microbial organisms there. So in a similar way these moral axioms can act as like x-ray goggles uh, and they can they can alter our alter and heighten our perception and I think that's really what people mean by taking the red pill, right? So this is a, a concept that's been in right-wing circles forever, is, is taking the red pill. And that's really what the red pill is, right? In the Matrix, the, the taking of the red pill is, is a technology that allows um, Neo to have this, this heightened perception uh, in, in the sense that he now perceives reality and not the simulation. That's kind of a tangent, but where I'm really going with this is I think it feeds really well into these uh, Renaissance uh, notions, or these notions that started to pop up in the Renaissance. And of course, it's older than the Renaissance, um, but the, in the Renaissance, there was this Neoplatonic movement, um, and I'm really I'm going to talk mostly about... Uh, um, I believe his name Baldessari was his first name, but Baldessari Castiglione, who wrote this uh, manual for courtiers uh, called, well, the Book of the Courtier. And in the Book of the Courtier, um, which you know I've found to be, uh, you know, with the help of, of, because uh, I've this is something I've talked about in classes that I've been in, but uh, some of my professors and I have really talked about this, and we find it to be a really compelling um, example of this Renaissance Neoplatonic uh, way of thinking. In uh, Book Three of the Courtier, uh, Castiglione has this uh, gentleman Pietro Bimbo, who was actually historically a Italian Renaissance Neoplatonic philosopher, um, stand up and give this this um, this dissertation almost on the relationship between beauty and goodness. And so, you know, in the Renaissance, what we're talking about um, with beauty is that beauty is sort of this outer shell that sits on top of an interior core, which is goodness, and goodness comes from God. So there's this idea that things are beautiful because they are good. And, you know, in the Book of the Courtier, this, this starts to pop up questions, of course, because people in the Renaissance aren't stupid. They understand things like, for example, sometimes beautiful women are, um, are not, first of all, they're not nice, right? So this is something that one of the courtiers says is that beautiful women are not uh, kind uh, because in his experience, uh, beautiful women are cruel to him. And of course, the, the, the reply that he gets in the book of the courtier is, is that um, he thinks that beautiful women are cruel to him because he wants to sleep with them and they uh, are rebuffing him. So they're actually good. Uh, and the other thing they, they note is that sometimes beautiful women, quote unquote, are morally loose, um, so they're they're actually not good. And so this is interesting. You know what uh, Pietro Bimbo in the book of the Courtier says is essentially that um, if something is perceived to be beautiful but is not good, uh, then it is in fact not beautiful. It's uh, so right here he's making a dis a distinction between prettiness or something that is appealing to the appetite, something that uh, someone might desire, uh, to something that's beautiful. And I think that's an interesting uh, point. And, and to, tie it, to tie it on back, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the dis the, this distinction between prettiness and goodness and, and beauty and how we as right-wing people can turn this uh, into something that, uh, that favors us. So I think, first of all, one of the things we might say is that the aesthetic reaction is the most 
powerful one. And, and, and why do I say that? Well, I, I think sometimes some of the most uh, some of the most emotionally powerful conversion stories, for example, uh, to various religious traditions, um, they come about because people are compelled by the aesthetic principles that go into the uh, religion that they are joining. So the, the way they build their temples, the way their priests dress, the way their liturgy sounds, all of these things go into the aesthetic principles of a religion, and oftentimes aesthetic converts are some of the most fervent, at least emotionally speaking, because there's something about beauty that cuts right to the heart of the human person in a way that, like pure reason, uh, just doesn't just doesn't work, right? So, so we have to understand that beauty and this aesthetic reaction is very powerful, and I want to take some. Uh, examples from fictional settings of how beauty and aesthetic principles have really uh, pushed people towards the right wing. And we can also think of some, some examples of the inverse, right? So uh, if you take the setting of Warhammer 40k, um, a lot of people are drawn to the aesthetics of the Imperium of Man. Uh, this is kind of a funny example, but I think people will understand where I'm going with this. So a lot of people who are very interested in Warhammer 40k, in the you know video games, and the tabletop game, and all the you know various artwork and lore that surrounds the setting, are they find themselves uh, really attracted to the Imperium of Man because of the uh, sort of Baroque style of their architecture, the way that they dress, the way that they carry themselves the uh, aesthetic principles that undergird their civilization. And people will unironically, I think, start to internalize some of the politics of the Imperium of Man. So obviously they're not going to become uh, xenophobic, genocidal, um, you know, uh, as, uh, people who... who um, who act in ways that the characters in the Imperium of Man act. Um, but I think it's clear that people who sort of absorb by osmosis the kinds of aesthetics uh, that undergird the Imperium of Man start to drift uh, rightward, at least in their subconscious sentiments. And, and I think it's a similar thing and maybe it's a little bit even more dramatic, uh, is the Lord of the Rings. I think there's a lot of people who were genuinely converted to a more conservative way of viewing the world by looking at the Lord of, Lord of the Rings. So people are compelled by the beauty of the Shire. And I think Peter Jackson's movies actually did a lot to, to help this. Because when I read the books, and I read the books before I saw the movies, thankfully, but when I read the books, I too was compelled by the kind of rustic charm and beauty of the way that the hobbits live in the Shire. And you get invested in the story, mainly, I think, a lot of people, because you want to see this, this beautiful jewel of Middle Earth, the Shire and the hobbits, you want to see that uh, protected and continue to... Um, you know, continue to survive. And so that's that's really part of the investment in the Lord of the Rings. And I think these two settings, unironically, for different for different reasons, right, have attracted people to right wing ways of thought through the application of their uh, aesthetic principles. Um, and 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 this flies in the face, I think, of of well, maybe it it maybe it doesn't fly in the face of progressive notions of beauty, but it, the way that we as right-wingers relate to this aesthetic uh, reaction is different than the way progressives react to um, this this um, this use of aesthetics, right? So, for progressives, right, beauty as something that's divorced from prettiness uh, doesn't exist. Um, it, their entire concept of aesthetics is just prettiness, just what the subjective or, or what the subject views as desirable is is what we call beautiful. In other words, there there's an equivocation between uh, what is desirable to the eye and what is beautiful. And 
It's interesting too because in progressive modes of thought, prettiness is actually dependent on political messaging. You'll note how they use the kind of beauty language like this is disgusting, this is um, off-putting, this is awful, so on and so forth. They use this kind of beauty language um, to describe things that don't have the correct political messages. So there's this relationship in progressive aesthetic thought between between uh, having the correct political messaging and something being pretty, which for them, of course, is, is something that is um, desirable to the eye or desirable to look at. Um, and this is interesting to me because what it ends up what ends up happening is that you have progressives that are a, a step removed from the real. So you know, right wingers, I think we can understand that something like uh, something like Warhammer 40k, like the artwork, for example, like we can understand that the way that the Imperium of Man's ships are constructed is pretty. It's nice to look at. It's ornamented and decorated. But we understand that there's there's actually something there's actually something more going on there. Because something can be pretty but not point to anything beyond itself, right? But there's another reaction that goes on when something is beautiful. So things that are pretty are think sorry, things that are beautiful are always pretty, but things that are pretty are not always beautiful. And so you know if you take these great battleships that the Imperium have, they're beautiful, not because they're ornamented and decorated and nice looking, but because they point to something uh, greater than themselves that is of value. So the reason they look beautiful is because they look like these Gothic churches, and these Gothic churches, they point towards the heavens, and they um, they sort of give this, you know, they, they point to things that are more valuable than just this big ship. And while I know that that doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really go with the Imperium of Man in the setting, that those are the kinds of associations that are given to, um, you know, that kind of artwork. And, and it's a similar thing with the Lord of the Rings, right? Like the Shire is pretty, but what's beautiful about it? Well, what's beautiful about the Shire is that there is, you know, there's peace in the Shire, and there's harmony, and there is, there's harmony between people and nature, there's harmony between people and other people, and there's this kind of, you know, there's this, uh, there are, sorry, there are virtues and valuable things that are, that are underlying what makes the Shire beautiful. And so, we as right-wingers understand that there there are things that are desirable to look at, and then there are things that are desirable to look at because they point to something uh, greater than themselves, because they point to something that is good. And so we have a sort of two-layer approach, a, a deeper aesthetic response, whereas people uh, with a progressive aesthetic um, sort of system will only have a surface level response and they will only have this sort of response to prettiness and at the end of the day their response to prettiness is a little bit shallow because it's actually it's actually informed by their political um, you know ideas and th whereas in in right-wing thought you know there is kind of this back and forth between um, you know between the uh, uh, to use uh, Dave the Distributist terminology, between the fundamental moral axioms and the fundamental observational laws, there's this back and forth, right? Where the, you know, what we perceive can inform the good, what what is good can inform what we perceive. In progressivism, we don't get this, you know, uh, back and forth, right? It, it only flows in one direction. And so this, I think, is why our right wing art and aesthetic theory is so important because we have this uh, depth to our worldview that progress the progressive worldview, especially in terms of aesthetics, uh, can't match. So one thing is it wins converts. So you know I, I pointed out these two examples of the fictional settings, but it's also true in just like general in a religious sense, right? Is that many people are converted to a religion because the aesthetics of that religion point to something that is good. It's a it's attractive for the sake of uh, goodness. 
Um, but, but also, you know, our aesthetic principles give us the ability to have a well-roundedness to the movement. So if you think of a, a movement, an intellectual movement that was extremely well-rounded, um, I actually think of romanticism. Now, now think what you will about romantics and what they thought, but they had this sort of, uh, they had this intellectual background, right, which ironically enough actually had, you know, there's a little bit of an intellectual background in Neoplatonism, uh, in Romanticism, especially if you read stuff like uh, William Blake, and he had these, um, sorry, not William Blake, some of the Wordsworth's earlier stuff, um, talked a little bit about, like, um, like the soul preceding, um, the body, right, or the, or the soul coming into, the soul being eternal, or, you know, some of these things that, um, some of these things that uh, Plato actually believed, um, they start to creep back in in stuff like Wordsworth. Um, so there's an intellectual tradition there. Um, wh whether or not you think it's it's good or useful is a different matter. Uh, but then there's also an aesthetic principle, right? So that there are, uh, you know, like for example, the, the common speech of the common man, the peasant or the laborer, is beautiful because it points to the simplicity of the common men. And they value simplicity and they value this kind of oneness and unity. And then it's also spread out into different kinds of art forms because you have romantic poetry, you have romantic painting, you have romantic uh, prose literature. And this also has uh, political implications and I think you see that in something like Dickens who's not strictly a romantic but is sort of a, a post-romantic, sort of a romantic-ish uh, Victorian who, uh, you know, very clearly I think is making a political uh, as well as economic critique of the early Victorian period, and he's doing so from this sort of uh, wellspring of romantic thought. So I think right-wing thought in the 21st century has the potential to have that kind of well-roundedness and sort of uh, universal totality that something like um, something like 19th century romanticism had. And so these are just some things I'd like to put out there, and maybe the community can mull this over for the next a uh, couple of days or weeks, but this is just something I wanted to get off my chest because, you know, after I watched the Distributus video, these were just the kinds of things floating around in my head, and I, you know, I didn't script this or anything. This is all just from some uh, bullet-pointed notes, but you guys let me know what you think uh, in the comments, or, you know, if you can get get with me on Discord, just, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, tell me what you think of my approach. Uh, but anyway, guys, this has been the uh, Highbound Convivium, and uh, I'll be signing off. God bless.